Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, hi, I'm Rick Hess, Director of Education Policy Studies here at AEI. Uh, it should be a fun conversation. Uh, we're looking on the intimate side, this is what happens when you get a rainy day between Thanksgiving and Christmas. Uh, I think everybody's watching uh, at home. We'll be watching uh, the, uh, the live stream. So appreciate those of you guys uh, who took the time to be with here in the room. Uh, what we're talking about today is what it'll take for social emotional learning to succeed. Um, folks in this room or watching this thing don't need uh, any run through on just how big a, a phenomenon a social, emotional, social emotional learning has become in American education over the last few years. Uh, as uh, my friend Checker Finn likes to point out, if you Google SEL, you're north of 400 million hits nowadays. Um, you, it's hard to talk to folks in school districts or schools uh, without the issue coming up. Uh, Tim Shrivers has got to feel like a well-spent quarter century. You, you, you're there. Um, the, the, the challenge, of course, is that we have a long history in education of uh, thoughtful, important, useful endeavors uh, finally reaching fruition, only to go south. They go south because there are pitfalls that don't get anticipated, um, because well-meaning allies or ideologues wind up turning ideas into something they were never intended to be, um, because with the burst of success finally upon them, a whole bunch of shoddy vendors and sleazemeisters jump into the, jump into the party and wind up poisoning the whole brand. And uh, so there's a lot that could go wrong, even when it feels like one is finally on the cusp of doing some good stuff. Now look, I say this as somebody who is fully supportive of the premise of social emotional learning. Uh, it, sometimes it's felt like we've forgotten it over the last 20 years, but the people in our classrooms are actually not little uh, assessment generating uh, physical beings. They're actually children with needs and concerns and challenges. And it makes a lot of sense for us to ask, how do we make them feel valued and welcome and supported to teach them the virtues that will allow them to be successful academically and in their lives? I'm all on board, but I'm only on board so long as we're actually doing this in a way that feels like it's going to do more good than harm. And I'm only on board so long as it feels like we're actually trying to tend to children's social emotional needs and not find some back door to start talking or promoting ideological or political agendas that are something very different. So what we're talking about today is how the heck you actually do this. The first panel we're going to have is talking about what are some of the bumps in the road, what are some of the challenges uh, that may be ahead for social emotional learning, particularly when we look back, say, over the past 10 or 15 years, and some of the challenges that other um, potentially significant school reforms have encountered. And then the second panel is really going to be focused on how do we make sure, or not how do we make sure, how do advocates and uh, the people involved in this work do their best uh, to ensure that social emotional learning is what they mean for it to be, that the advocates anticipate these challenges, and that the social emotional learning effort proceeds uh, thoughtfully and sensibly uh, given what we've learned and given the, the challenges ahead. Um, the hashtag for the event is future of SEL, uh, hashtag future of SEL spelled out. The event is being live streamed. Full video will, of course, be available uh, on the AEI homepage going forward. Uh, what I'd like now to ask is our first panel to step on up, and we will get underway. Uh, doing introductions from the far side of the stage over, uh, Checker Finn, President Emeritus of the Thomas B. Fordham Foundation for more than four decades. Checker's been at the forefront of national debates about school reform, and he's authored a lot of books, uh, including Learning in the Fast Lane, most recently, uh, The Past, Present, and Future of Advanced Placement. Uh, so next to Checker is Devin Carlson, the Presidential Research Professor at the University of Oklahoma. Devin has written about what SEL advocates can learn from No Child Left Behind. And the, and the challenges faced navigating tensions between a national reform effort and the realities of local schooling. Marilyn Rames is founder and CEO of Teachers Who Pray, a faith-based nonprofit that is more than 100 chapters nationwide. Marilyn's author of The Master Teacher, 12 Spiritual Lessons 
that can transform schools and revolutionize public education, and has written about faith as being the F word of social and emotional learning. Uh, so next to Maryland is Jay Green, distinguished professor and chair of the Department of Education Reform at the University of Arkansas. Jay has written about the moral and religious roots of SEL. And last but not least, Karen Nussel is president of Conservative Leaders for Education. She previously served as executive director of the Collaborative for Student Success, where she was tasked in part with trying to helm uh, one of the more significant uh, but challenging school reform efforts of the past decade. Uh, she can talk a bit about that. Jay, let me start with you. Um, you have written about the ethical and religious roots of SEL. Can you talk a little bit about what do you mean by that, and how do you understand what SEL is, and sure. what do you mean when you say it has ethical and religious roots? Sure. So, so um, I think social emotional learning is what used to be called character education, which before that was called moral education, and it's as old as education itself and is probably central to the purpose of education. So like you, I, I agree that this is a um, very important area for, for us to discuss. But because it has these roots going as far back as education, um, religious organizations, religious traditions have developed extremely elaborate sets of content and pedagogy for how to convey certain values to shape children in desired directions to have them develop certain character skills. Um, and, and these have been refined over centuries or millennia. And the thing that I'm concerned about with the rebranding of this effort as social emotional learning and attempting to refound it from scratch on a scientific basis is that um, it's as if we're trying to start a new religion um, uh, with no uh, history of tradition uh, or history of, of, of content or pedagogy. And so we run the risk of being a kind of new age cult, um, you know, where, where we're going to invent new traditions, but it will feel like Dianetics. Um, and and that's, that's, I think, what we have to be careful of is, is um, understanding that there is an intense need for the moral and character development of, of students, but that we should recognize that this has been around a long time and probably draw upon those long-standing traditions as opposed to attempting to reinvent this entirely uh, from scratch. And Jay, what would you say to those who go, well, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. SEL is really different from character or moral education. That it's about things like executive function and helping students feel comfortable. It's not about this other stuff. Right, all of those things uh, have, can be found in, in older versions of character education and moral education as well. And in fact, um, if you look at the five categories of, of SEL areas according to Castle, they actually correspond almost identically to the four cardinal virtues. You can just have to take two to, into one to get the five into four. But they correspond extremely well to the cardinal virtues, which go back to Socrates and, and actually were incorporated into Christian thought very early. Um, and so these ideas have been around for a long time. They're not new concepts in, in any way. And nor should we be surprised by that. People have always been concerned about how their children will develop into being the kinds of adults they want them to be with the right character and morals. And that's what we're trying to do here, too, which I think is good and appropriate. It's just I don't want us to think of this as a new scientific endeavor as opposed to a long-standing endeavor with tradition that we should draw upon. Checker, I mean, you have seen a variety of school improvement efforts uh, begin oh, one or and two. encounter, <laughs> encounter uh, various challenges along the way. Um, and, and you and I have written a bit about how to think about SEL in light of some of past efforts at things like values clarification and character. Curious, as you survey the landscape and think about SEL, what, what does this look like to you, and what are some of the challenges that you'd anticipate? Well, first, the, the sort of blind man's elephant aspect of this is illustrated by the fact that uh, Jay um, sees the roots here in religion and morality, and I tend to see them in whole child psychology. Uh, equally old, almost almost as old, uh, certainly uh, uh, Dewey and maybe Rousseau, and uh, 
I tend to think of this as the latest iteration of let's educate the whole child, not just the, uh, not just the reading and math side of the child, the, the, the part that takes tests. I, I don't think that thought is incompatible with what Jay just said, uh, but it, um, it does suggest that um, if we're seeing different uh, kind of or, uh, origin, origin myths uh, or origin stories for this current phenomenon, it's, it's, it's already complicated, and I think it actually is. Um, the, and everybody's in favor of whole child education, okay? Nobody's in favor of half child education. Uh, nobody <laughs> thinks that kids are only little, little, little test takers who learn only reading and math in school, and schools have no other function. Everybody also knows that if a kid isn't uh, uh, reasonably uh, uh, comfortable in his own skin and uh, uh, healthy enough and fed enough and cared for enough, he's not likely to learn a whole lot of reading and math on a given day. So, so of course, um, this is um, a, a, a worthy reminder that we have to think about the whole child, which is more or less what you started at, at, at the beginning, Rick. But um, earlier efforts in this uh, realm have often ended up in conflict with academic learning rather than supportive of academic learning. Uh, and I think the huge challenge here is to is to do what the Aspen Institute Commission said should be done, which is to, uh, uh, to view uh, SEL hand in hand uh, with academic learning uh, and follow that extremely difficult recipe that they laid out uh, for how to do that. A couple of people in the room have already heard me use the analogy of an early Julia Child recipe that takes uh, nine pages and has 27 steps and 43 ingredients. Uh, and uh, I really do view the Aspen uh, sort of recommendations as comprising something that complicated. And in the application of that kind of a recipe in a real school by real people with limited time, sometimes limited talent, always limited resources, uh, likely to end up only, only doing part of it. And if that part ends up being uh, focusing on social emotional well-being at the expense of academic learning rather than the supportive of it, uh, then this isn't going to last very long. And if it takes on an ideological edge, as some of those earlier movements uh, um, absolutely did, uh, and ends up being um, disliked, disapproved, even hated by people on a, of another political persuasion, um, then there's real trouble ahead. Uh, and I think that if the SEL folks, um, many of whom are in the room, uh, uh, end up, for example, neglecting civics and citizenship and character as part of SEL, uh, there's going to end up being a political split um, that will cause this thing to go the way of uh, values-based education, value-free education, um, uh, call it what you like. I think there's a real risk ahead that this could then just sort of sort of go away, like a lot of these earlier other things did. At which point, we're just back to test scores, we're neglecting the other half of the child, and I'm not sure we've made any progress. And we might have neglected gains we could have made on the academic side as we go through this exercise. Chuck, you mentioned that some of these earlier efforts wound up getting uh, ideologically colored. How, yeah. how, not Everything couple, these days can get ideologically colored. That's I mean, right, but we're talking a, about stuff that happened back before the 21st century. What, what hard, happened in those cases? It's hard to think that far back these days. Um, the, anything that gets into the, that is led by zealots who also are associated with other causes, sometimes other, other campaigns, sometimes other politics, um, ends up building enemies. Things threaten parents very easily. And as soon as you know, seven parents say, you know, you're, 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 you're dealing with privacy, you're invading my child's privacy, why do you care about his emotional well-being? Your job as a teacher is only to deal with his cognitive well-being. As soon as you've got seven parents saying you are intruding into the prerogatives of parents and family and, and religion, um, and possibly Girl Scouts, um, you begin to build um, a cadre of enemies. Um, and they're likely to divide politically, too. I think this has happened often in the past in American education as we've taken on one thing or another. It happens in reverse, too. I mean, people who only focus on uh, academics are told by another group of parents, you are neglecting my child's artistic and creative uh, uh, needs. And, uh, uh, and you're making my child feel bad because you're giving him a C 
Um, and so this academic thing you're doing, to cramming for the test, is really ruining my kids' education. So it can happen in both directions. Hmm. Karen, speaking of <laughs> school improvement efforts getting called up in some of these larger dynamics, you know, at, at the collaborative, part of your job was to help try to steer the common core through some of the challenges of the last decade. You wrote a paper for recently sharing some of what you learned or observed up close. Curious, as you think about what you're seeing, what are a couple of things that feel similar or different right. uh, to the way the Common Core scenario played out? Well, Checker's exactly right in identifying how it breaks down. Um, and so the, the key is, I think, at the community level, while it can be informed by what's happening nationally and thinking that's happening nationally, at the community level, you have to explain to parents the problem you're trying to solve. You can't just institute this change because it's the next cool thing to do or because you feel like it's being, you know, you know, someone from on high has said it's the right thing to do. I think too often in education, we, we leap to the solution without explaining to parents in the community that there's a problem to be solved. And so, um, because, and, and you know, it goes back to Jay's point, which, you know, so every challenge has an opposite opportunity, right? So the fact that some of this stuff may have ancient history as its origin, regardless of, of which uh, you agree with, that's an opportunity to say to parents, look, this has been a need f throughout history. It's been articulated throughout history. Um, and you'll, you know, I've had the opportunity to see a lot of focus groups of parents talking about education reform, uh, which is a horrific, um, can be a horrific <laughs> experience. Um, but but this, this, this notion of teaching kids skills that help them do life resonates with every parent. They're terrified they're not doing enough of that at home or that they, they can't be there all the time when they're kid might face a challenge, might have to negotiate, might, might be facing a bully, you know, might need help and not know how to ask. So, so every, this resonates with every parent. They, they want this happening in schools, um, but I don't think they, they, want, they want some conversation about it. They don't want it to just happen without knowing exactly what's happening, what problem is being solved. Well, that sounds like it's tricky. If you're an advocate <laughs> and you're like, all right, how, what, we, we, need to talk, we need to explain it to them. We need, but parents are saying, yeah, I get this. It sounds important. How do you know how much more you need to explain? How do you know when they're on board with what you're selling? So, Rick, you and I are not going to know. This is a conversation that has to happen at the community level, and that that is... That is sometimes the step we skip as, as education advocates. Um, and this is a huge part of what we learned, I think, in the Common Core fight, um, is that there was not enough conversation that was going on at the school and district level about these changes. Um, there was not enough buy-in from teachers and parents. Um, and so when the teacher-parent conversation happened, it often went like this. I don't know what these new standards are. They're making me do it. And the parent's like, well, who's the they? <laughs> and all of a sudden, the teacher and the parent are now unified against the man who is changing the standards, right? Um, even though standards were a very wonky thing that, like, a lot of, there wasn't a lot of conversation about standards. They were something that was just a wonky thing that educators did in order to improve education. And all of a sudden, it became, you know, oh, my God, look at this stupid math problem my kid brought home on Facebook. So... So there has to, you know, like I said, you and I aren't going to know. There has to, be a, there has to be a group of leaders that are locally based that can take the tools being provided with national, by national leaders and apply them locally. And yeah. it's hard. Now, one of the concerns, Devin, that, that, that gets raised by what Karen just pointed out is there's always this concern if you're leading this thing nationally, you, want, you don't want your local leaders to screw it up. And you don't want... Yeah. You, you, they might not know what they're doing. You've got all these smart experts. So it seems like there's lots of really smart people with fancy degrees and, you know, brand names that will go out and they'll help message. And they'll take your money as a funder to help build strategies. And, like, how do you know when this stuff is helping and helping folks locally do what Karen just talked about? And how do you know when these folks are actually 
poisoning your brand or getting in the way or turning it into an astroturf kind of exercise? I mean, I think it's a really tough line to walk. Um, there's been so many of the prior efforts from No Child Left Behind to Common Core that were really popular initially when they're at their national reform level. But the minute we try to take them and put them in schools, in districts across the country, people don't see what they thought they were being sold. And so with No Child Left Behind, they wanted high standards and schools held accountable. But then what they see is you know, multiple choice tests and weeks of test prep for that. And they, you know, that turns them against the, the effort more broadly. Same thing with Common Core. They were promised world-class standards. And then when you get down into the school level, they have math problems being taught in ways they've never seen, right? And so figuring out what national efforts help and which na national level hurts requires the, the insight of the folks on the ground. It involves listening to parents, listening to teachers, to tell them, hey, this isn't helping us. Don't, don't do that anymore. And respecting the insights of those teachers and parents when it comes to trying to um, sell or, or convince the community that this reform effort is actually a solving a problem, as opposed to the next reform that, that people in Washington or people nationally want to do. But is there, is there a rule of thumb? How, how, do, you, how do you know? I don't think there is a rule of thumb. I, I think it's, it's, it has to be done on a case-by-case by case basis, and that's something that our prior reform efforts hadn't done a very good job doing, right? So, I mean, so part of this, Marilyn, is one of the things that you've long encountered is you're trying to help teachers of faith in, dis in discrete communities make be part of their local conversations. I know you've had a nightmare trying to fundraise for this. Yes. Whereas folks with the infrastructure and reach who are part of these coalitions seem to be better positioned to fundraise as these things come along. If you've got, if there's a natural, very human tendency for funders to fund folks who seem equipped to do the work, rather than these disparate, no-name, faceless little local endeavors, like how do you ever figure out who to invest in locally and how to deal with kind of Devin and Karen's challenge? How do I? How do they? How does how anybody? Do, okay, so I'm not quite sure exactly what that question means. Well, okay, that's fair. All right, so let me ask you a different way. Uh, let me let me go let me go a slightly different place. One of the you you know teachers who pray is very much about working with teachers of faith yes. to have a voice in their schools, their communities, their systems. Mm -hmm. um, you've written about how faith is the F word of SEL. Yes. Um, you know, particularly your experience in Chicago. So can you, uh, let's talk a little bit about that. This is a very local phenomenon. Teachers who are wedded, you know, who are of faith, who are part of their local churches. Yes. When you say faith is the F word of SEL in these schools or systems, what do you mean? Okay. So we know the F word is a word that's not appropriate in, the, in good company, depending on what company you're in, but <laughs> in professional company. Um, generally speaking, and I think that faith has that effect when you talk about public education because people are like, separation of church and state, no, 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 we don't want to talk about it, it's inappropriate, all things. All when you things say not appropriate, what do you, what do you mean by that? Because, um, there, you know, public school should be a godless entity, it should be scrubbed of any type of spirituality whatsoever, and um, you know, it's just there's no place in the conversation for the role that it plays. But without spirituality, uh, I'm afraid to send my kids to school because you need to have a sense of mission. You need to have a sense of calling, I believe, to effectively overcome day in and day out as an educator to go in that classroom and go in these situations where it feels pretty hopeless. And I believe hope comes from a spiritual place. And um, so does diligence and excellence. Something has to motivate that when you walk into blighted communities and, and situations that are pretty much difficult for human beings to kind of intervene. And you know, sometimes you just absolutely don't know what to do. So um, just to be clear, Teachers Who Pray is not advocating praying with students. Um, or proselytizing with students, but to build a coalition of faith-based teachers who can build community with each other and be a SEL for the, the professionals so that 
when situations arise, and we know there's a the mental health crisis in, in, in schools, public schools, private schools, kids are trauma, um, they experience so much trauma, and um, families are struggling, and so when you put a teacher in a, in a situation like that, they, they have to be equipped not to struggle with secondhand trauma, and we know that is a real thing. And so that's essentially what Teachers to Pray is, teacher to teacher support, but I also advocate for supports for students, faith-based. But when you, when you say schools have been scrubbed of faith, or, 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 you know, or, yes. or godless, well, what do you mean? Because I think some people hear that and they go, what are you talking about? That, that's not what we're doing. Well, yes. why do, what, what do you mean when you say that? Well, it's, I believe it's a misunderstanding, a misconception of the law. So most of the time when I ask, so I, let, me, let me say this. When you're dealing with identity with students, we talk about all different kinds of identities of students, racial, sexual orientation, gender, um, but we rarely talk about faith identity. So that's one huge gap because that is a big part of students' lives. That's a part of being a whole child is the, the tr faith tradition they come from. Um, and so that's a huge gap. I would say also um, just what you can and cannot do in terms of talking about religion, in terms of reading um, religious texts, what can be said, what cannot be said. A lot of times, like, Students, it's hard to even understand parts of our American history and our documents if you don't have a basic understanding of the Bible. Or Dr. King's speeches, for example. You don't understand the, the references that are made. So it's important to have that component of education, even if it's just an academic uh, aspect of it. But I mean, so, so I guess, EJ or Marilyn, I mean, but is, is this really just an effort to try to smuggle religion into schools? as part of a conversation about SEL? So I, I think religion has never left schools. Um, it's, I mean, especially- It's pretty well hidden in a lot of them. Yeah. No, 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 no. I mean, if, 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 you have to get out um, a little bit. And, um, <laughs> and I, 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 I can tell you that, that, you know, living in Arkansas, and this, this is not unique to Arkansas, this is true all over the country, outside of certain kind of large urban centers, um, there's a lot of religion in schools, and communities are, have a lot of organization around religion. It's very important to them, and it's important part of how they raise their children, and education is just an extension of people raising their children. That's all we're talking about. And so the problem, other than rebranding and restarting from scratch on a scientific basis, the other problem that we, that we have, I think, is that to do this as a national movement for social emotional learning, we have to do it at this incredible level of abstraction that obscures all of the real differences from community to community in the values they prefer, what character they would like, what, what priorities they would like to give to different SEL competencies. I mean, it's a little bit like the, the generic nature of the Google motto, don't be evil, right? Well, what does that require? What do I have to do to not be evil? I mean, it sounds great at first, but then there, there's no substance to it. And for it to be meaningful, you have to actually flesh that out. Similarly, any moral education or any SEL curriculum has to take these abstractions like persistence and make it real by giving it actual concrete flesh and bones, which will vary from community to community depending on their priorities. And so. As Devin's saying, it really has to be local, and I think Karen's also saying that, that it really has to be local um, because it will have to vary. But that, um, I mean, so Karen, I mean, like this seems directly out of the Common Core experience. Like, I mean, how much localism are we, you know, are SEL advocates serious about? I mean, are they really okay with the idea that what these things mean is going to be dra dramatically different in Birmingham than Berkeley? Should they be okay with that? Yes, I think, I think, so I don't think that they should be, I mean, I don't think they should be apples and tomatoes. I think they should be all fruits, right? <laughs> um, but so I think, that, so if you take the Aspen Institute report that Checker already referenced, 
um, and, you, and you ask local communities to sort of operate within that framework, I think there would be a way to give them tools to say, okay, in your community, what, what in here is, are your priority? So in other words, I think if we give everyone sort of a general playing field and ask them all to stay in that field, but allow them the community um, you know, identity or whatever to, to choose from within that framework, what they prioritize, what they think is most important, what they think applies to the kids they're serving, I think that's the way we get there and, and give them you know, sort of tools, if you will, toolkits to, to, f to have that conversation and find those priorities. Because often what we do is we say, OK, here it is. Go. See ya. <laughs> right? We have to help them have those conversations and come to those decisions. One, one important distinction we ought to make, though, is Common Core and a lot of these other things were state mandates yeah. imposed by the state and followed up by a state assessment and an accountability framework. I don't think anybody in the SEL crowd is proposing that SEL become a state mandate. Uh, I hope not, anyway, because uh, it's hard to think what form that would take that wouldn't end up being harmful. Uh, but, but so this emphasis on localism and the possibility that Cincinnati might do it, but Columbus might not, or that uh, Cleveland might do it in one way and Toledo in a different way, is, is not parallel to Common Core. And the notion mm -hmm. that you might have to have these local conversations, which I think is very smart, uh, it's prob but keep in mind also how off-putting that is to everybody in Washington and any national commission, the possibility that things might not happen everywhere at the same right. time in the same way. Well, it's uh, not just the national. It's the fu if I could be so bold as to say it's the funding community. So um, I'm sorry if I'm offending anyone who's listening or in the room, but the funders have often been very enamored with, with speed and scale. And I think and there uniformity, are, and uniformity. And I think that this is one of those places where that might not be as achievable, especially when, if we're not mandating it. There was a reason we mandated the standards. We actually were trying to get everyone to raise their standards. It didn't get communicated that way. Um, but that was the goal, and that actually did happen. Um, but, it, but if we're not going to a mandate, there has to be some um, acceptance of the fact that it might not go super fast and reach immediately millions of children at once. But check, I mean, you're saying, you know, Cincinnati doesn't, maybe Columbus doesn't. Mm -hmm. I think for folks who believe SEL is critical, and you were like, yeah, whole child's always been part. Well, that would seem Very unacceptable. Upsetting. Very upsetting to them. And so, we, but you said it's a bad idea to push for it everywhere. Why is that a bad idea? Uh, it's very, this came up actually at, at, at Jeb Bush's gathering of state legislators quite recently. Uh, public officials have a limited toolkit of things they are able to manipulate. They can manipulate standards, they can manipulate tests, they can manipulate graduation requirements, they can manipulate teacher uh, certification requirements. There's not many things they can actually manipulate and impose across, let's say, an entire state. It's hard to think how SEL could enter into any of those except in the most gentle way. I mean, you might say that every teacher preparation program should be attentive to the social emotional health of the students who these teachers are going to be dealing with. That would be reasonable. And I mean, you could make SEL the vaunted fifth indicator under ESSA. How, with that what be? as the metric? <laughs> SEL health. With what as the metric? <laughs> but I mean, but if you could design a powerful oh. assessment, would, 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 you be, would, would you be supportive or would you not be supportive? In theory, I guess, but I've seen no evidence yet. A lot of people are working on developing these kinds of assessments, and so I'm not, the jury's not, I mean, it's still out. But I haven't seen anything yet that I'd like to see uniformly imposed on every school or classroom or teacher or a kid as a, uh, as a proven metric of more than tiny little scraps of what SEL is supposed to be about. Devin, I mean, you alluded to the way that NCLB was initially broadly popular, and then as it translated into practice, what are the lesson? What are what? What's a lesson or two that you might offer for folks thinking about SEL assessment and mandating SEL, say at the state level? I I would just you know Campbell's law is what I would cite that the, the minute an indicator becomes something to strive toward, it, it goes bad, and it's easy to imagine 
how, how mandating SEL assessment threatens the autonomy of teachers, right? Their relationships are with their kids is what brings teachers into the classroom every day. And the minute that there's an assessment attached to those relationships, that completely undermines a lot of that so of, the, of the aspects of that relationship. So that's one. Uh, that's Say one. more, though. But I mean, so for instance, I mean, we have teacher evaluation is partly, or say class in early childhood, sure. uh, is partly about trying to set professional norms for how we expect teachers to interact with kids. Why is an SEL assessment different from, say, teacher evaluation? Well, teacher evaluation, I thought, it was focused mostly on the effectiveness of increasing reading and math scores, right? And teachers were able to, rightly in my view, push back against that. And if they can push back against a measure of their effectiveness in increasing reading and math scores, it's, only, it's pretty easy to imagine how easily they can make a strong argument against efforts to measure relationships with the kids in their classrooms. And so that's just one cautionary tale, I think, of, of trying to mandate SEL at the, at the state level. Another thing that I say about SEL is I think some of the, the advocates and funders don't recognize that SEL is already happening in many more schools than they think. It just doesn't look how they think about SEL. And so aspects of... So of, for, for instance? So in, in Norman, Oklahoma, where I live, there are lots of, of programs across the schools and the districts that, that emphasize respect, integrity, and, and you know, things that map pretty clearly onto the castle wheel. It might not fall neatly into that rubric, but the, 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 the motivations are very similar. And so I would encourage folks and advocates to, to you know, think broadly. Go and look at schools that are, that are outside of major urban areas and see what's happening in the classrooms because I think more SEL is occurring than, than advocates uh, at, at least you know, right do now and recognize. Why they have to look outside of urban areas? Why well, I think they, they, they can look in urban areas as well, but I think that's where most education policies are focused. Right, and it's a big country, and so if you're going to put together an initiative that that plays in Norman, Oklahoma, and Chicago, you have to recognize the realities on the ground in in all those places and everywhere in between. Marilyn, one of the pushes in the Aspen report, for instance, uh, has been the importance of partnerships with community organizations, with community groups. Um, I'm curious, you know, working with lots of teachers of faith across different communities. How engaged have you seen communities of faith, have you seen local churches as part of local SEL efforts? Yes, there's, there are pockets that are extremely um, active, and there are, are huge areas that, again, because faith and education is like one of those sore spots that people don't want to really interact. But it's, it's, to me, it's a matter of just educating people. So we, as two years ago, established the, the Harvard um, Leadership Institute for Faith and Education to bring partnerships between faith groups and school districts and, um, and to see where these things are happening. So for example, in um, Nashville, there is almost every school in the Nashville um, school district has a church or a group of church volunteers that come into the schools and provide services to support the school. And Nashville's like, first of all, saving the district tons of money because these are volunteers. They're working with students, they're tutoring, they're doing after school programs, they're hall monitoring. They have, there are more eyes there on the students. And I don't see why that can't happen in every school district. So that goes back to being local and um, if there is a faith-based program after schools, parents would opt in. And if given that option, I would say many, many parents would opt in uh, uh, to have some kind of faith-based SEL program after school, but the problem is they don't have access to that. People are not making that, putting that on the list of after-school programming to choose from. And that's the big thing that I'm really trying to push for. One of the... So this is Irvin Scott's made yes. up of, right? So one of the things I'm curious about, so there's some districts, sounds like, that are enthusiastically doing that. Yes. But you mentioned, for instance, the importance of different forms of identity and yes. how we think about these issues. One that obviously comes up frequently is gender identity, uh, transgender issues. Obviously, I mean, I think any of us who spends time in school districts or education advocacy groups has heard lots of people suggest that 
you know, one of the things we, one of the problems is that communities of faith, that churches, that synagogues and mosques are on the wrong side of, mm -hmm. as, as they see it of some of these issues. And so they see it as zero sum. If you invite in institutions of faith, you're making some of the children in a building uncomfortable. You're threatening to those children. Yes. How do you think about the right way to, uh, to address that tension? Well, I mean, faith, particularly Christian faith, is all about um, loving thy neighbor as you love yourself. Loving God with all your heart and loving your neighbor as yourself. So you're supposed to reach out and, and be loving to everyone. And that is, that's across the board. Um, in light of differences in ideologies about sexuality, those have to be dealt with in um, equal amount of fairness in terms of saying, like, you can't pit one group against the other. Like, everyone has their view on what is appropriate sexually and what isn't. And I think we, we run into issues where we... Um, say one is appropriate and one isn't appropriate. In terms of the school district, it has to be a safe environment for all children. Whether you are on the left side or the right side or in the middle, don't care, it just, you know. And so I think that when it comes to the school day and what happens in schools, teachers in school districts have to protect the religious liberties of its students and families, as well as protect those who have differing views. And how you do that is gonna take a lot of work, it's gonna take a lot of um, conversation, but I think at the end of the day, lawsuits go both ways. And there are a ton of like faith-based law firms that are really fighting really hard for students' right to believe in their religious principles that have been in place for millions of, oh, not millions, but hundreds, thousands of years. And um, we just don't want to see that. Children deserve to be taught and to be loved regardless. And how to reach that medium is something that is difficult, but it has to be addressed. And so I don't know. There's no really easy answer. But religious groups, I mean, churches don't come into schools to talk about gender issues. Like, they come into schools to like, support students. And if they opt into an after-school faith-based program, then they have to know what they're going to get through that if the parents opt the kids into it. And Jay, I mean, it seems to me, as Marilyn talks about this, that part of the impulse for what you described might be that folks are hoping to bring into schools some of the strengths and virtues that religion cultivates, but without some of these complexities and tensions. Is that fair? Right, I, I think some of the hunger for SEL out there is people are noticing that something's missing or is not as present in, in their child's education as they would like, and I think the religious aspect is the thing that they're noticing is missing, and, and so there is this effort to somehow secularize it and, and in, in, incorporate um, the uh, desirable features without the icky God part. Um, <laughs> but the, the, the problem uh, is that I think that that really isn't going to work fully. Um, and I don't think it's going to be possible to separate these things. Can I add to that, yeah. Jay? Yeah. Because what happens is that now meditation, and I write about this in my piece, that like, some meditation, some kind of Eastern like thought and, and religious practices have made their way into public schools, but it's been put off as not religious. Um, and um, that has been challenged in multiple places, but the issue is that, in, in all honesty, it has been effective. There have been a lot of um, calming of children just by asking them to meditate, asking them to think about being in a place that brings them peace and joy and all those kind of like new agey kind of things. So to really say that SEL isn't spiritual, it is, I believe it's very spiritual when you do it, but then again, you butt up against this separation of church and state and what's spiritual and what's not spiritual. So it's hard to name the thing. No one really wants to name the thing that's happening, but... Um, 
when you're doing some of these yoga practices and you talk to people who really do practice yoga for their religion, they say, oh, well, that is spiritual. This is sacred to us. As you know, this is essentially the only country in the world where we get hung up over what Jay called the icky God part in school. And, and I mean, we do have a way of trying to minimize conflict on, on, the, on this dimension historically. And the way we, we did that was by uh, greatly decentralizing control over education. That is, we let communities raise their children. And we let them raise them in their own traditions and in their own ways with their own priorities to a great degree. And it's really primarily a, a function of the last half century where we have dramatically centralized control uh, of education in state departments of education and then into, na into the federal uh, department of education as well um, that actually exacerbates these conflicts. Now they become unresolvable. They are zero sum. Um, and, and it's not as if religions are the only ones making judgments about good and bad, right? Non-religious groups within schools are also making their judgments about good and bad, are also making some students feel excluded, as Marilyn was saying. And so it becomes zero sum. The way, so people would sort into relatively homogenous communities of values. That is kind of how America has looked over its history. And, um, and then they could raise their children collectively in their schools. And, and so if we don't decentralize in general, to some extent, we are never going to be able to effectively do SEL. And we'll certainly not be able to do it without enormous conflict over the, content, this, the real content of the values. What do you mean by that. decentralize? What would that, what's that mean? Um, so we have, we, I think we'd have to let. I mean, look, even state standards, I, I hate to you know, aggravate checker hair, but even state, you, you are. Um, <laughs> even state standards only go back you know, but it's half been century. 20, he's used to it, 25 years of this. Right. So right. Um, you know, um, I, if education is an extension of child rearing, it seems to me that we should let people raise their children in their communities. And they'll figure it out, and we can help with resources so that if there are disparities of resources, we can help equalize that. But the trouble is that once we start doing that, we have an inclination to start bossing people around and telling them how to do it, how to raise their children better, um, raise them in the way that science says is correct. And often that's incorrect, but, but it's our new form of authority that we like to invoke. But I, mean, I, I, I could go through the usual litany that there's a public interest in education as well as a private interest in education. And we need an educated population as well as uh, individuals. But let me just say, in partial agreement with Jay, well, a, a non-trivial impulse behind school choice is allowing people to sort themselves and their kids into schools that they think work for them. And that's been true in both private school choice and charter schools and so forth. And I think that's a, that's a um, I don't know, 30% of the rationale for school choice. Okay, let's go ahead and open it up for questions. Um, ask folks to catch uh, either Hannah or RJ with the mic. Um, Please identify yourself by name and affiliation. Um, I'm going to ask that folks actually ask a question. Uh, yeah. If we get 10 or 15 seconds in and I don't spot a question coming, we'll give somebody else a shot. Anybody? Not? OK. I'll take this. Uh, 10 or 15 seconds haven't passed yet. <laughs> okay. can Fair I, enough. Can I add something real quick? Uh, no. No. Yes, yes please. please. OK, thank you. Um, I was reading that uh, suicides outnumber murders. There are twice as many suicides in this country right now than murders. And people, I don't think Americans really realize that. Um, and a lot of these suicides are starting with children that are very young, like 9, 10, 11, 12 years old. And so there is a huge case for SEL. I'm a huge you know, supporter of SEL. I think it needs to be in every school district. There needs to be a more robust it's not just an urban thing, it's a, it's a rural thing, it's all over, it's everywhere. There's a huge issue. My, prop, my position is that the faith community can assist in curbing some of the, the, the mental health issues that we have in schools. And that, that is the goal of um, teachers who pray. And there are teachers also committing suicide, let me just say. It's underreported, but it's happening. So. There's a need there, and I think the faith community should not be the F word, but should be a part of the, the, the conversation with Castle and others. 
Uh, it's Neil Langar, National Endowment for the Arts. Um, I, I appreciate, uh, I understand some of the panelists' uh, concerns and trepidation with um, you know, the idea of a national standard or even a state standards regarding SEL. Uh, or holding students to some kind of standard that's going to be kept. But can some of you talk a little bit more about what you mean when you say communities decide this? Because in, in the wrong hands, isn't that kind of a recipe for provincialism when we're talking about such core value, you know, when we're talking about so many permutations of human character that can in fact, you know, um, you know and how, how who, and does a majority kind of rule in a particular community in deciding those things? David, yeah, you want to speak to that? I mean, I mean, I mean there, there are ways that SEL could be to manifest poorly, right? I think like you identify one, one possible danger. And so you need to rely on, on you know, district leadership. You need to rely on um, the democratic form, but also be aware of the fact that we have to protect and include all students in, in these efforts. Um, and so what that looks like in practice is something I don't think has really been grappled with well yet, like how we actually do on the ground in, in districts, in schools, what, what we're talking about and, and when we refer to as the local aspect of it. Jay, you want to speak to it? Um, well, I mean, we do have a problem of tyranny of the majorities in local communities. That's always been a problem. Um, and again, the way that people try to handle it is by trying to sort themselves into places where they find the dominant values to be desirable. And that's part of how people choose where to live. And um, uh, and then they'll they develop rituals and that exist to this day. I mean, so remember that Halloween, Christmas, Easter, Valentine's Day; these are all important rituals, in, especially in elementary school, that organize parts of the curriculum, significant parts, and that convey certain values. Like everyone has to get a Valentine's card from everyone else in the class, and this is an important um, part of their development. But they're using a, a religious holiday. I know that we don't think of it as religious, but it is religious. I mean, I can tell you in Jewish day schools, they don't do Valentine's Day, nor do they do Halloween, right? So the, you know, these are our religious holidays. And, and in communities where this is part of their religious tradition, this is, they use those holidays to teach lessons. And they'll put different emphases, emphases on them depending on what the values of that community will be. Will it be oppressive to value minorities within those communities? It will be, and it's it's. But it's hard to fully figure out how to how to adjudicate that, other than having kind of freedom of movement as as an escape valve for for you know. And then in extreme circumstances, there can be legal protection. We could set boundaries, but within certain boundaries, we might just kind of leave communities alone. At this moment, we don't have to get very far from the U.S. Capitol building to see tyrannical majorities. Um, which side of the building depends on which majority you're looking at. But uh, this is not just something in Fayetteville or, or, or Norman. Anna? Yeah, I'm, I'm Don Dakin, and I'm a retired lawyer, and I have three children and three grandchildren. And my wife and I came today and, to learn what SEL is. <laughs> and you said at the beginning, everybody knows what it is. Uh, <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> well, so, Shanker, what are we talking about? Well, I, I, the next panel is, <laughs> is full of people who wrote the Aspen report that we've been referring to. Wait for them. <laughs> <laughs> Jay, what is SEL? <laughs> so it stands, stands for Social Emotional Learning. That's what it stands for. And um, uh, this organization, Castle, has come up with a wheel that has five categories of, of social emotional learning skills or goals or objectives. I don't, I don't remember the exact language. Um, and uh, these are things. These are, again, what you probably think of as character traits, character skills, or, or moral qualities. Uh, and, and the trouble is there are so many different words that overlap that could mean close to the same thing that I'd have to give you a very long list of all the words that are contained within that wheel. But they include things like, like 
we've mentioned persistence, or it could be called grid, or is it conscientiousness? These are all maybe different words for maybe the same or related things. But they can also be things like um, respect, uh, self-esteem. Um, so these are all qualities that help people um, uh, handle themselves and handle the relationships with other people. And this is not new, right? I mean, this has been around since as early as we've had children and have tried to raise them to be the kinds of adults we want them to be. We want them to have these qualities so that they can interact with other people in what we think are decent ways. We want them to be decent human beings. And so yes, we want our children to have economically useful skills. And some of these qualities might also pay off in the economy. So employers want punctual employees. They want obedient employees. All of these might be qualities uh, that are Those are the contained. wrong words. Collaborative. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, but, but the point is, like, how obedient do you want them to be? At what, point, at what point is one value supposed to take over from another value? At what point are they supposed to stand up for respect or their self-esteem versus, versus um, their collaborativeness, their collaborative quality or their conscientiousness? These are, all of these qualities potentially are, are overlapping with each other or at odds with each other. And so each community will come up with its own ideas about how to organize these ideas, and how to prioritize them, which is why it, when we talk about it in these generic ways at a national level, it will sound flaky. And I, and, and, or or and trite, the, or trite. And, and, it, and there will be, a, while there's apparent demand for this, if, if it's maintained in this flaky, kind of new age cult sort of way, parents will rebel. They will detect it, and they don't want that. They, what they want, is some of the stuff that religion used to give them in schools, and they don't have quite as much of it as they want, so they want more of that in there. But if they get substituted in New Age cult, they'll rebel and kill it. And, yeah. Anna? Uh, thanks. So if you'll indulge me just a tiny Everybody's little bit, Rick. Uh, Hunter Gelbach, I'm over at Johns Hopkins. Um, I will ask my question, but I, I might give you an alternative definition of uh, social-emotional learning with your permission. Um, so I think that, you know, Jay's got one sort of approach to it, which is absolutely right. I think there's another way to think about it, which is what are the, the fundamental psychological needs of students? And I think there are some fundamentals that we could imagine almost everyone agreeing on. So we need social connectedness, right? Interpersonal relationships are vital. We need students to be motivated, and we need them to have sort of an appropriate and developing level of self-regulation. And so the question I, I sort of want to pose to you guys is, I, I really appreciate the thought, but the sort of like we need our own little enclaves in each little place getting more and more homogenous and doing their own thing that works for their idiosyncratic values. I, I get it. It worries me. Um, what if we think instead about some universal values, things that we all can fundamentally agree upon as being important? Um, could we not have some uh, national level consensus around some of those things? And I'll throw out those sort of three as examples of things, I think. And repeat the three, Hunter. Uh, social connectedness, so students need to have some friends at school, they need to get along with their teacher. Motivation, you're not going to get any learning without students being motivated, and self-regulation. So, so, uh, yeah, so I, I would argue that, I mean, in, in principle, in theory, that's, that's a great way to start. And that's how most of the prior large-scale reform efforts have started over the last 15 years. Everyone was on board with, with world-class standards. Everyone was on board with holding schools accountable. It's what that actually looks like when you implement it in schools, in districts, where things start to go sideways. And so I, I think there has to be a balance between that level of agreement at, at a broad scale and the realities on the ground. And so I'm you know, not going all the way to letting each community dictate exactly what they do every, in every domain, but you know, drawing some sort of balance between that and this broader uh, higher level agreement I think is, is, is where it needs to be, but also really, really difficult to strike as the last reforms have shown. Sharon, I feel like somebody's going to have your job <laughs> to try to steer what Hunter just sketched. Well, what I, advice would you share? So I feel like there is an eye of a needle here that can we can get the thread through. 
Um, so I agree that we probably could come up with some broad um, notions of agreement, but then you have to allow local communities to have the flexibility to figure out how to implement those in their in a way that they feel um, ownership over. And I think that's been our mistake in the past. And I and I just want to say, I mean, so this is the fundamental tension in our system, right? This this where where is the where is the balance between local control and sort of um, equality, right? Making sure that every kid has the same opportunity and gets the same level of quality in their school, right? This is a this is a huge tension. It's a hugely an American thing, right? This notion of things these things should be done locally, um, and so if it were easy, it would have been done. <laughs> but but what you're hearing from us up here is that the sort of the the scar tissue of having done the national thing badly over and over and over and over again and never learning from it. And so we're all grappling with this. How can we give local communities as much control as possible while still having some sense of accountability over the quality and the the making sure that we are evening out the inequality in the system that may exist community to community. And I don't, and I don't, think, that that's, um, I don't think that that's a state to state thing. I think inside every state, this is a huge problem. I mean, pick any state and you would, I mean, Iowa, you know, the, the difference between what happens in Des Moines and what happens in a little town of 5,000 people in Northeastern Iowa where, where I, raised my kids is dramatically different, even though the population doesn't look that different. The, 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 the nature of what's happening in schools in those two different locations is dramatically different. But, but I, I also just want to quickly say that, that I don't think those three things are universal. They sound universal only at a level of, of generality that they're not actually very meaningful. So it's roughly the equivalent of don't be evil, okay? <laughs> we could agree don't be evil, but what does that require? So similarly, we want our kids to be in interconnected, but how connected? Not too much, right? You want them to be to rely on other people, but not so much that they lose themselves. Or uh, if you want them to be self uh, to have motivation, you want them to have enough motivation, but not too much. You don't want them to be obsessed with things, right? So there are balances in each of these things of the and where we think the appropriate balance would be is going to vary. Decker. Just that there's also a little bit of risk with the universal values of ending up trivial and superficial. I've been in too many schools where you walk in and on the door it says it's February, the value of the month is kindness. And if you come back in March, the sign says it's courage. Uh, and then what does this actually mean besides a sign on the door that says the value of the month is kindness? I mean, it just often amounts to practically nothing. Well, sure. to that point, Okay, I want to. I want to. Okay. I'm going to give Checker the last word on this one. Okay. Um, Checker, sir. Uh, given, given, kind of how, how is Hunter saying that? I'm like, yeah, that, that makes sense. I'm down with that. Like, what? Given that, but then given the cautions that you just articulated about uh, triteness, that Jay just articulated. But what's the one thing that most concerns you about? What could go south for SEL? Well, the, the thing that most concerns me is that it will deflect us from the academic achievement that this country needs, whether you want to look at NAEP or PISA or anything else that's come out lately, uh, that says American kids aren't learning nearly enough. Now, if SEL can be a support to that, I, all, I'm, 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 I'm all in. Uh, if it becomes a deterrent, I'm not. And as I've said in, the, in one of these sessions earlier, uh, uh, the uh, SEL may be a precondition for academic learning, but academic learning is not a precondition for SEL, which is to say uh, you can feel awfully good about yourself and still not know how to multiply two-digit numbers. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> While we're waiting, while, while, while Tim's, uh, I think, finding his way back in, um, premise of the day is real simple. It's easy to go to places where you can hear about the wonders of SEL or what the heck SEL actually is. Uh, it's, um, it's easy to go to places where you'll hear lots of products for SEL. I'm not interested in that. First conversation was really about some of the challenges 
uh, that may be ahead for SEL, some of the concerns that don't get as much attention as I think they deserve. What I want to talk about in this panel is very practically how can those folks who have been invested in working on issues of SEL, how to do this well, how to build children's networks, how to develop these skills, how can they do this work most effectively uh, with an eye to some of the practical challenges uh, that were enumerated in the last panel? Um, from, uh, far, from far stage uh, working over, Julia Freeland Fisher, Director of Education Research at the Clayton Christensen Institute, also author of Who You Know, Unlocking Innovations That Expand Students' Networks. Uh, Bror Saxberg, Vice President, Learning Science at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, where he leads CZI's thinking about how to apply learning science to real-world learning situations. Uh, Jackie Jodel is Associate Professor and Special Assistant to the Dean at the University of Virginia's Curry School of Education. Previously, she oversaw the National Commission on Social, uh, Social Emotional, and Academic Development for Aspen. Uh, Laura Hamilton is Senior Behavioral Scientist and Distinguished Chair in Learning and Assessment at the RAND Corporation, where she directs the RAND Center for Social Emotional Learning Research. And Tim Shriver co-founded and currently chairs the Collaborative for Academic Social and Emotional Learning, CASEL, which has been mentioned uh, a number of times already, the leading school reform organization in the field of social and emotional learning. Uh, let me start with this. I, 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 let's start, rather than me kind of ping you guys with practical challenges, I'm curious from the conversation we just heard, I'm going to ask if each of you will pull out one thing that struck you that you think is an interesting opportunity uh, to think about how the SEL community can best do its work. Uh, Broer, kind of if you'll kick us off. Sure. Um, there were several. I guess the one I'll uh, pick out is the really interesting opportunity to try to take what we know about uh, neuroscience, development, cognitive science, uh, you know, uh, behavioral economics and other things, so sort of information at that level, and bring it to communities to really inform what are those really important community-based conversations about what should we aspire for our kids to be able to decide and do? Because you may reach new conclusions with the information we actually now have about what's possible, and you may reach other conclusions based on what we know is really tough. Like, if you have kids who are under stress, you know, cortisol levels block the neurochemistry of learning. I'm sorry, it's just that's how the biology works, and therefore, what does that mean? Does that change how you want to work your schools? Because it's just what we understand about very low-level operating mechanisms within the brain. So there's something about this mixing of information with local communities that, that seems really intriguing to me. But just even the way you articulated that, it sounds like we're moving from the arena of local democratic decision-making into... Uh, biological science. And at that point, we don't have a lot of community conversations about how to set a broken leg. So I'm kind of curious. Yeah, no, I think about it more as a, a, this ends up being a kind of an engineering conversation in the way that there are many solutions possible, many solutions possible, but there are, we're learning about some real constraints about how our machinery for expertise and learning actually works. And so this is the threading the needle, I think, that you referred to, which is it's, it's not about dictating what you're going to teach or how you're going to teach. It's rather informing a community of what seems to be possible, what does work, how these things seem to work, so that the community can make really informed decisions about what they're going to do and which goals they're going to prioritize. Mm. Um, I think that, and I think it's tricky because what you don't want to do is, you know, come in and try to impose something based on what we know about learning, because that's not actually what it is. It's really more about functioning and, you know, systems, and then you have to have your value-based goals around what are we trying to achieve. So that, that's one thing for me. Jackie, how about you? 
I think what I took away from the earlier conversation, and just to build um, on this conversation, it's not as though, I, I don't want anyone to, to take away from this conversation that, that we're soft, that this is not evidence-based. I think we really need to ground the conversation for a minute in the evidence base. There's about four years of social science, which has recently been joined in the last five to 10 years with neuroscience, to demonstrate that there are a collection of skills. It isn't like we're pulling these skills out of the air. This is based on research. There are a collection of skills, social skills, emotional skills, as well as cognitive skills. There are mindsets, there are attitudes, and, the, and character and values comes into this that all taken together demonstrates that when we take the time to create environments and we instruct using those skills and competencies, that children learn better. Absolutely, that's, that's where I think we have to start this conversation. Mm. Julie, how about you? Yeah, I think as a, as a veteran in a more recent movement of personalized learning, which has suffered some of the same, um, I think, downfalls that we heard in the last conversation, I think there's just a discipline, sort of to Jackie's point, that needs to be brought to the conversation of what outcomes are we actually talking about. Then communities can, can choose from their mm -hmm. menu of outcomes around sort of self-determination. But if we don't name those outcomes and we keep using this umbrella capacious term of SEL, then neither are the technocrats bringing enough discipline nor the community conversations actually moving the needle. Mm. So hopefully we can get, I'm not the expert on this panel on outcomes, but we actually have some here who I think are. Speaking of which, Laura. Yeah, good. <laughs> Thank um, God it's her. <laughs> yeah, so, um, I don't know about that, but uh, uh, you know, I think to, to Roar's point too, one, you know, we, the earlier panel talked about the fact that this is something schools have always done. Um, you know, they've called it different things. Um, teachers care deeply about building these skills in their kids. They care about forming good relationships, creating, you know, uh, supportive climates in their schools. Principals care about this. And so one of the things I think we need to do a better job of is, is sort of taking teachers and educators' expertise um, and building on it rather than coming in from outside and saying, you know, we have this program that we want you to adopt. You know, figure out what they're already doing well. Um, we've seen in, in places where we've been, you know, working with uh, schools and districts that want to adopt SEL that there's a lot of good stuff already going on, um, and it's really a matter of helping helping educators understand what's going well, where could we improve, and what's the science. I think teachers want to hear that science, um, and they want their work to be informed by it. So, so I think that's that's one important um, consideration. And then the other one, then this is um, sort of to to Jackie's point is. Um, really helping communities understand how the development of these skills links to college, career, and civic outcomes. Um, all three of those domains are, we know from research, are relevant. And so we're not just talking about soft, squishy stuff that we, um, you know, we, we do uh, with little kids. It's, it's thinking about the development of this all the way through adolescence and then how it's preparing kids um, for what comes next. And, and most communities, even in places where there might be a concern about detracting from academic achievement, um, there's also a recognition that kids need other, other skills and competencies to be successful in life. And so we need to do a better job as a, you know, advocacy or research community at, at, at making that clear. And Tim. So we worked on a report uh, about 20 years ago uh, to try to introduce this concept of social and emotional learning as a field. And it opened, it's a, it's a little book we published with ASCD, and it opened with uh, a discussion about uh, social and emotional learning as a missing piece. Um, it, the point wasn't that it was a missing piece from education, it was a missing piece from the field of education. And I think there's a big difference. Uh, what we have been trying to do, many of us, and I say we, not my organization or my uh, particular uh, soapbox, but what we've been trying to do for quite some time is align people into the creation of a field, which is a fundamentally different project than launching a reform effort. It's a fundamentally different project than launching a program. It's a fundamentally different project than launching a point of view, an ideology, or even a brand. Um, it, the goal was to build a field that crossed the boundaries of research policy and practice, that fundamentally broke down the barriers which thwart progress in education, between scholars and practitioners and policymakers, that broke the boundary between academic learning and social and emotional development finally and completely as a field, 
that broke down the idea of bad kids and good kids and recognized that all children need these developmental skills, that broke down the boundary that says uh, that this is a deficit model in schools, that behavior is good and bad, you're a good kid, you're a bad kid, and tried to begin to recognize that good developmental thinking Recognize behavior as information, information that needs to be managed, uh, uh, supported, changed, channeled, uh, helped, nurtured in all of its various dimensions. The building of a field, I think, uh, maybe I'm overthinking it here a little bit, begins to recognize that all the points that were made in some respects are great, are good points. I, I use Plato and Socrates in presentations like Maria Montessori and John Dewey and, uh, and Jim Comer. Uh, that looks at local control and standards as a tension point and a balancing act, which we all are living already. But why don't we get good at it, as opposed to worrying that if we don't have enough local control, we're going to uh, lose parental uh, uh, supports, or if we have too much local control, we're going to have the tyranny of uh, the majority. Uh, both of those are risks. We know them. Now let's build a field that tries to manage them. Uh, we know that there's a risk of detracting from academics, uh, as Checker has argued very effectively and very importantly. Uh, and we know there's a risk that if you don't do this, you will not get to academics. So now let's get after it. Let's figure out where the right spot is. And that's going to require the efforts of a field, not of Tim Shriver or Jackie Jodel or Roger Weisberg or any other single scholar, and not actually of any other single field. Uh, it's going to require the development of multiple models that are tested against evidence, as Jackie has so importantly placed. And if you look at the 100 or so programs that we've evaluated over the years, programs now, not fields, but programs that we've tried to evaluate with Rand and other collaborators, we've tried to say that these are social and emotional learning programs that are effective because they have begun the process of taking science over 20, 30, 40 years and translating it into practice in a way that up till now we think is effective. But a field, just like in science, I mean, we've got a lot of cures for cancer. A lot of people working hard on it, but a lot of people still get sick. And so we're still working on it. And if, when all of us are dead and gone, we're going to, I hope, still be working on this issue. And we're going to still be trying to balance the issue of faith versus, you know, as a private choice versus faith as a, as a collective uh, social uh, commitment. We're going to be trying to balance the issue of uh, learning to task and learning to your heart learning to feel included and learning to include another child. Uh, we're going to be continually trying to balance what works in Alabama versus works at, what works in Berkeley. Uh, these are not going to go away. We can raise them, but the challenge of this work is to actually get after it. Because it's not an either or. We do not have, here's what I would say as a premise, we don't have a choice on whether we have a social and emotional learning program in schools. We do have a choice as to whether it's any good. Mm -hmm. uh, so, we can recognize all these tension points, and they're all good. I mean, I, I, there's not, there wasn't a single point here made, well, maybe one or two points. <laughs> made, uh, but there's not a single point that was made that I don't think has merit. What we have to recognize is that the polarizing way of we argue as policymakers and to some extent scholars often splits the difference without showing the path to the alignment. And, so, okay. no, 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 yeah. no, I told no. I checker, cut me off if I keep going. <laughs> no, I like Thank it. you. But Thank ja you. No, absolutely. So, but Jackie, so given what Tim just said, so I mean, I think that was, Tim, I think that was, you know, really thoughtfully sketched out. Um, but those of us in this room who spent enough time in the early days of teacher evaluation or school improvement grants or NCLB where people said, right, we get these tensions and they kind of, you know, well, not always. So the, people who, the people who I think were particularly thoughtful about it acknowledged the tensions in the manner Tim just did. Um, but nonetheless, they, you know, I think they wound up getting taken uh, off the trail by those tensions. They wound up going into ditches. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, Jackie, as you think about kind of the, the opportunities of this field and 30 or 40 years of work feeding into how should folks, how should those of you up here who have played leadership roles in SEL, how should folks out there who are working in this field, whoops, what, what's the right way to start tackling these challenges given that they're inevitable and that this work has to happen? Well, I think, 
let's let's take a moment and really think about what Tim said here, because what Tim said is it's time to just get at it. And I think that what's so striking today about this conversation is the level of consensus. Yeah. When you have Checker Finn at the end saying, you know, let's let we all agree to, to the basic framework of whole child, you know, education. <laughs> you know, you know so that you know that you're, you're in a, <laughs> you know that you're in a in a good spot. So I would I would so I would argue that today at this moment in time and I think we've probably been here you know for a couple of years but at this moment in time we're pretty much where early childhood childhood education was about a decade ago when the discussion shifted from is this a good idea to okay now it's time to get at it okay and that's where we are now let's just let's just get at it and while I take some, um, you know, I, I don't agree with Checker's assessment that the Aspen report is a Julia Child recipe. What I do think is that he, what he, his comment, you know, it's a good one because it, it, it speaks to the complexity of how this work, can, this work can just get too complicated at times. And if we want to make it, you know, as simple as possible, um, and just to provide a framework that communities can build up from, I think that there are probably you know about five ele ele elements, and, and probably five is too much. And I and I invite everybody else to jump in here, especially um, my boss of three year, years, Tim, who did this far better. You know, the the first one is you know as as Tim always, you have to create safe environments that are relationship based, right? That's the first piece. The second piece is you have to do instruction differently. So you know he said it either either or. It's not it's not either or. It's both end. You have to teach kids these these competencies and these and these skills, and you have to embed it, embed them in their academics. Absolutely, academics is is central. You have to teach adults, you know, to model these behaviors so that they can teach the kids. These behaviors. I mean, adults, adults, I mean, that's basic. As Jim Comer always said to me, Jackie, there are no children who are problems. The only problems in the room are the adults. <laughs> right. And then you have to, it's this whole notion that we've spent much of the conversation about is it has to be community driven. It has to be place based, community driven. Um, Communities creating their own specific visions about what what student success is, but that but saying that it has to be grounded in the evidence base. Roar, kind of. Given what Jackie just sketched, and given your given that you referenced this as kind of an engineering challenge, what does that look like? So Tim kind of sketched the field, said there's a number of tensions. We both. Those tensions are real. We have to respect them, but we got to get after it. What what does that mean that we've learned about how to do educational engineering with an eye to those tensions and with an eye to getting after it reflectively? I think there's a couple of things that come out of this. One is we we may have to accept that um, the way we begin to uh, alter how our teachers and school leaders work in schools is not the same as the long lists of research-based <laughs> characteristics that we want the individuals to end up exhibiting. So an analogy would be you, you don't train an actor to play Hamlet by giving them long lists of what are the ideal behaviors of a Shakespearean actor that need to be expressed you know, every time you start, you know, a, 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 new, a new line. Because that's impossible. You know, an actor cannot think of 40 things at once. They need to be trained and they need practice and feedback on how to do things in ways that end up being consistent with a whole bunch of those things that the research says are what we're looking for. So, and this is in part this distinction between kind of the science side of it and then the engineering side of it. And you know, how do we help teachers and principals actually begin to do their work better is to really think through well, what, what, what do those things look like and how do we help those communities come up with those things 
that are consistent with a bunch of the research, but are actually comfortable and doable for their community, within their community. So on the surface, it may look completely different between two communities, but that in fact, because of what they're already good at doing, they can actually execute things that are consistent with the evidence and that actually then really drive uh, academic and non-academic development uh, within those communities. So I think the trick is, yes, we need the research and we need the individual aspects and all that, but we also need a new way of uh, designing and helping our educators and, and leaders uh, to, to do this work that doesn't confuse them either, that actually allows them to do the practice they need to become good at things that will work in their community. So, so a simple example would be? Um, let's imagine, uh, you could imagine a place-based kind of work, depending on where you are. Uh, you might have different industries uh, engaged in uh, work uh, around a, a group of kids, right, and, and their families. And so uh, the, the kinds of things that you'd want to do around, I don't know, pick uh, something like uh, curiosity or something like uh, persistence, the kinds of examples you might pick out, um, the way you might talk about it with kids, the, the kinds of projects you might do, might draw on, well, what, what is the work that goes on out here? You know, who, what stories from the local community would you bring in? And then show how, yeah, that's an example of, right? That could look really differently community by community, depending on what the industry base is, or even, and this is an interesting puzzle in my mind from the earlier conversation, which is you can have a community that is multicultural, you can also have communities that are monocultural, and you, you may need different kinds of teaching approaches that can leverage the multiculturalism as part of what you're doing that will look very different than a community that is working from a more monocultural aspect, too. But I, but I think in all cases, it really is about being very intentional about designing new practice and feedback for the practitioners that is aligned with the information, the research, the, the goals the community wants. Julie, I mean, this speaks to some of what you've written about in terms of different ways of trying to develop student relationships and student networks. Kind of curious, in light of what's been said before and what, what's been on the field about the notion of a field and the tensions, yeah. how, how, if you could say a couple words about how you've thought about this. And yeah, maybe to be a, a little bit provocative and name a challenge instead of an opportunity, but I'm pregnant, so you have to be nice to me. <laughs> um, I'm super pregnant, so you're nice, super nice to me. Um, you know, uh, what I will say, I, I appreciate the point about the field being built and about the sort of amazingness of the consensus in a room in D.C. right now. That being said, the Aspen Report, which I didn't quite realize I would be on the stage with the authors of, but the Aspen Report... The word skills appears, I have this written down, 140 times. The word relationships appear, appears 23. And I say that not to be a think tank asshole and sort of like throw that back at the authors of another paper, but to, but to make the point that I do, want, I do think we have to keep an eye on the center of gravity of this conversation and the fact that, to your point, this work is relationship-based. And I have wondered throughout this conversation this afternoon and looking at what various advocates are pushing in the field, whether relationships are getting sort of lost as a huge part of the point, the original point of a movement to talk about the social lives of our students. And so I've, I've just put that out there as a, I think when we're trying to thread the needle of a national agenda and a local community, it does come down to relationships. And I think that that may be getting lost when we try and come up with sort of a perfect roadmap um, to implementing an agenda that, that addresses these sort of local national tensions. Um, and the reason I bring this up is that I think relationships need to be treated as outcomes. That's why I'm on this panel, not because I know anything about SEL at all, but because that's a, a big conversation that I think has been missing from the academic standards-based world, but is even in some cases missing from the SEL conversation, ironically. Mm. I mean, I, 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 I'm curious. I mean, the, the way Tim articulated this, I'm just flashing back to the, not, not, not this building, but our old building a couple blocks over 10 years ago. <laughs> I remember having conversations like this, Common Core teacher evaluation at the time. And again, the people who I like and respect most in the space, I remember them saying things that sounded broadly similar to what Tim just sketched. Hey, there are some of these tensions, we're aware of them, we're going to do our best. 
Um, and, and I guess I'm curious, given, given Tim's point, look, this is happening. It's going to happen whether we do it consciously or not. So let's do it. Let's do it well. We have to act. What lessons do you guys draw from how we've seen school improvement grants or personalization or teacher evaluation or Common Core or school accountability, all of which had, you know, are easy to like, made a lot of sense to everybody, um, in some sense are going to happen. We're going to evaluate teachers whether or not we do it. We have standards, what, whatever happened with Common Core. Schools are going to be accountable in some way, shape, or form. And yet it felt like we got stuck with some of these tensions, which were not unimaginable. I'm curious, as you, know, as you guys think about how we move forward, what are some of the lessons or insights or intuitions to guide us how we wrestle with this? Well, I think this comes back to the earlier conversation about working closely with communities and actually, and somebody said it earlier, uh, the pre previous panel, about how funders need to be aware that it's got to be done community by community. And I think in a certain sense, we're going to have to expect to slow down as opposed to go quickly. Because a lot of those other efforts, they moved very quickly to put in either instruments or uh, standards or other things and didn't actually spend the time to, to explain or even try to create a motivation for those things from the community's own goals themselves. And I think that's a thing to learn from some of these prior efforts that then either just foundered or else as soon as the white minivans left the, you know, left the station, it, why were we doing this? I don't know, it was because those people were here and they offered us money, so that's why we did this. Mm. And it, instead, you want the community to begin to, to understand, hey, this is really important to us, and there's new news we didn't know about how to get at this, in fact. That's the field building. That's, that's the new news that comes into this. So, dang it, we want to do this. How are we going to know if we can do this? Well, we got to have some ideas about, are we making progress on these things? And now you have folks, instead of saying, hey, don't do any darn testing on me, who are saying, we want these changes. And we need to be able to iterate and make them better. So we got to have some idea of how it's going. We can't just you know, imagine our way. And that then becomes sticky, I think. But it's going to take more time. You know, it's sort of funny me saying that coming from Redwood City and Silicon Valley, right? You know, we're, we're all about doing it in six months, right? That's the theory. It's like, no, not this. You know, this is longer term change to people's behaviors and even in some cases values tied to understanding. You just, that's going to take time to create the trust and then to generate those conversations that lead to something exciting for the communities. Yeah, so I, I, um, I think along with that, one of the, when I think about what went wrong with teacher evaluation and No Child Left Behind and, and many of these other initiatives, um, it has a lot to do with how we used assessment um, and using it sort of as a hammer imposed from above um, as opposed to something that was, um, you know, kind of collaboratively developed with, with the communities. And so, Teacher evaluation is a good example of this. We, um, you know, worked with several districts that were adopting, um, you know, new teacher evaluation systems that involved both student achievement-based measures, but also um, rubrics that were used um, to look at teachers' practices. Um, and before those rubrics got high stakes attached to them, um, teachers were really, you know, by large majorities on board with this because they wanted the feedback. They wanted to know what they were doing well and where they could improve. They liked the fact that these teacher evaluation systems looked at, um, you know, you think about the, the whole child model, they, they, they looked at all aspects of their teaching. So they looked at classroom management, at the emotional climate. If you, if you look at something like the class rubric, which I know a lot of you are familiar with, um, it addresses a lot of those things. <coughs> when, when teachers started to push back was when they started having high stakes attached and it started to feel like it was being externally imposed. So, um, you know, one of the things I worry about is 
Um, there's been a lot of people out there saying we, we, should, we don't want to measure any of this stuff because we know, we know how that's going to go. It's going gonna, it's gonna to go south. Um, and I think that you know, there's, a, there's a few problems with that. One is that teachers are already measuring this stuff. They're already forming impressions of their kids' social and emotional skills. I, when I was a kid, I remember getting behavior ratings on my report card. You know, So that, that, that's already happening. Um, there are all sorts of inherent biases in, 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 in you know, how that plays out. And so I think having thoughtful, validated, systematic ways to, to measure this stuff to inform their instructional improvement is something that educators can benefit from and, and you know, a lot of them have said that they want. Um, so I think that that's a risk, that we're going to just stop measuring because everybody is worried that it's going to, you know, have the, the no child left behind effect. Um, I think the, you know, the, the other thing that, that I, you know, get concerned about is that, you know, as we're thinking about, you know, engaging communities and so forth, um, we need to really be thinking of students as, as stakeholders in this and engaging them um, and thinking about, you know, how this can work for them. Um, and one of the real concrete ways I've seen, um, you know, issues around that is, is uh, not recognizing kids' developmental trajectories. So understanding that, um, you can adopt an SEL program in an elementary school and it might go really well and the kids love it. Um, and by fourth or fifth or fifth, sixth grade, they start kind of rolling their eyes at it. And um, I've raised three teenagers, so I, like, I totally um, can understand that kind of adolescent cynicism. Um, at the same time, if you can take advantage of where those kids are developmentally, you can engage them give them some autonomy and some decision making, then you'll get them to buy in. And so I think that um, what's often, what I often see missing is kind of this understanding of the developmental trajectory and that needs to be built in um, as well. Tim, well one of the points that your field reason, or field building framing I think raises, and Jackie pointed to early childhood, is another case that was much more, to your point, conscientiously field building, mm -hmm. as opposed to a bunch of the reforms, which are more conscious that I listed. I mean, as you think about this, what are a couple of the, 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 the important leverage points or, or tools that this field building mindset might offer in addressing some of these challenges that aren't there for folks who are more engaged in promoting a particular reform yeah. strategy? Yeah. <clears throat> well, uh, so, so a couple of people have mentioned, the, to me, the elephant in the room on field building. Well, there's two, probably. Uh, one is measurement. Uh, uh, we have good measures of many things. We have discipline referrals. We have graduation rates. We have grades. We have dropout rates. We have truancy rates. We have absentee rates. A lot of administrative data. We've got school climate surveys that are increasingly normed that are pretty good, not too bad. We don't have great individual measures. We have a lot of individual measures, not ones that are good for schools, uh, at least certainly not for summative assessment. And so we don't really have a perfect formula. Uh, we have a good way of evaluating programs and interventions that's not so good for evaluating whether they work in a particular school. So measurement's a big issue. It's open, open door, lots of good work being done, lots of creative work needed. Uh, we're going to have to break through some of, these, uh, some of the ways in which we've thought about it historically to get it right. Uh, <clears throat> portfolio assessments, all different. So I won't go into that, but I think it's a big issue. And a lot of people are expert in it, both here in the room and watching and working on it. And Laura's one. Uh, and I think it's really important. Um, uh, the second thing I'll say is we need an implementation science. Uh, a lot of what's been discussed up here is a reflection of questions around how to do implementation well. Uh, and I said a field needs this. All education fields need it. We don't really have one that's particularly good. Honestly, uh, most implementation science looks like it's a new chemistry textbook series. We buy it. They teach it. That's the implementation strategy. A little bit of pre-service, uh, a little bit of in-service, I should say. Not much pre-service, and off you go. Um, that's not effective implementation in this day and age. We should be smarter, better than that. And I think uh, I want to pivot now to just a, you know, there's a lot of questions in the room about what's, what to be afraid of. And Karen's giving me good education on uh, uh, what to be afraid of in the Common Core experience. God, oh my God, I wasn't involved in that one. <laughs> but um, I think we also ought to recognize what we should be excited about. And uh, it's implied in a lot of these conversations, but, and I, I'm, believe me, I'm not going to pick on a pregnant woman because I have five kids and I should know better, but <laughs> I'm going to suggest that word counts are not the only way to measure. Agreed. The, they they totally are a way of measure. Speaking of measurement, they are a measure of <laughs> emphasis and importance. They're not the only measure. Two fifths of the Castle framework is a relationship based uh, uh, components. The third, 
arguably, uh, decision-making skills are heavily relationship-based. So the field as a field, uh, you know, to some extent, Jim Comer's a founding a kind of father of this. His whole message is it's all about relationships. Uh, you, you're right that people that get on emotional tracks can sometimes uh, play, pay less attention to the social side of things, and people who are very socially oriented can pay a little less attention. And some people are more comfortable with one than the other. But the field is trying very hard to hold these two in tension and recognizing their interdependence. What happens internally affects relationships. What happens in relationships affects internal states. Uh, we know that. Uh, so I'd say on the implementation science side of things, what we're doing well right now, Rick, is we're creating and have been actually for the better part of a decade place-based networks that look at implementation in the context of evidence and try to tailor solutions to local realities while at the same time respecting norms. So we know a lot uh, about uh, cortisol and the neurobiology of stress and its effect on learning. We also know a lot about how schools are teaching stress regulation and self-awareness to mediate the effects of that stress and allow learning to take place. The reason we know a lot of that is the teachers have been working on it in collaboration with their peers and their administrators and experts and scholars and having two-way feedback loops for the better part of a decade or two, depending on how you count. And so we're getting a lot better at it. Uh, we don't have to start from scratch. We can tailor and modify stress regulation and stress management st strategies for individual schools. But if someone says, we can do this without regulating stress, I would say, you don't have much evidence to support your claim. And many people would say, well, how could you say that? The tyranny of a Washington man, you know, partisan, this, that, and the other thing. Well, I do think this is a field, and we should have a basic science. The science should be child development. We've never had a basic science the way medicine, this is Jim Comer 101. Medicine has a basic science, anatomy. Any doctor learns anatomy, no matter what else you learn. We, as a field, ought to learn child development. No matter what else you learn, chemistry, physics, whatever, you, you ought to know child development. And if you know child development, you know something about stress, you know something about behavior, you know something about emotion, you know something about relationships. And it is knowable. It's not just all local innovation. Right? You can modify for local conditions, but it's not a thousand flowers blooming and anything goes, because that's a disaster. And it's particularly a disaster for kids with great vulnerabilities. So we need an implementation science. We need measurement as a part of it. We need a, a, an understanding of how implementation actually can work well when created by communities of practice and long-term commitments to change, three, five, 10, 15-year horizons, not six-month horizons. And we need to get out of a policy framework, with all due respect, you're right, Redwood City and all that kind of stuff. It's great to have funders come in and want to give us <laughs> quick money or give anybody quick money in order to get quick gains. But that's not the way this works. It's just not the way it works. And if it were quick and easy to do, it would have been done. And we wouldn't have an achievement gap, and we wouldn't have 50% yeah. of our kids with anxiety disorders, and we wouldn't have a 40% dropout rate, and we wouldn't be failing on all the PISA tests. So, Anybody that thinks the way we've done it is working is not paying attention to kids, okay. right? And so we need to draw faith-based. We need to do things differently. And that, in my view, requires a strong commitment to implementation with a commitment to evidence and local attention and allow these people to build these things together. Get out of the ivory tower, into the field, and people in the field need to get out of a thousand miles an hour and into creative discussions about their profession so they can learn from each other and actually build creative and constructive solutions. Julie, two, two questions um, out of what them. One, I'm kind of curious, given the points Tim was just making about uh, the evidence base and the science, how do we think, how, how do you think about the relationship piece in light of that? Is it the same kind of thing that you we... You're talking to me or to me? To you, yeah, yes. yeah. So one, how do you think about relationships in terms of this larger evidence-based question? Yeah, so I'm glad you brought up sort of achievement gaps and opportunity gaps because that actually hasn't been a sort of why that we've been talking about today, even though I think that that has energized some of the um, momentum in the field around this topic. And I think the thing I would point to is absolutely more parts of the wheel, the castle <laughs> wheel, allude to relationships. The piece that has felt missing, if we truly care about SEL as an instrument for equity, is that relationships are outcomes in their own right, not just inputs to skill development. And I think that's where the, the conversation can get, or this, again, center of gravity can shift in favor of we're going to arm students with these social and emotional skills that allow them to, to sort of live their best social lives, lowercase s, lowercase 
L, um, but we're not actually talking about their access to relationships, their access to networks, which are equally important in an equity conversation. Mean, you, so, say more, John. Oh. So what, do you what, say, what an economist me. would call your social capital. If we stick in the sort of skills conversation, we're still talking about students' human capital, to use a labor market term. And that is very important for both thriving in their communities and in the labor market. But I think the opportunity, the thing I get excited about, which again, I'm not conveying because I'm just exhausted and pregnant, <laughs> the thing I get really excited about is SEL could produce relationships as outcomes, mm -hmm. and I worry that that's getting lost as we just hone in exclusively. But what do you mean by that? What's a relationship You mean as social capital? You mean external mean to the school capital. and external to the culture Meaning of the I, I community? I come out of an SEL program where I've learned empathy by doing a, a cross-cultural exchange with a classroom across right. the globe over yeah. video chat. Yeah. It's not just that I now have a bundle of empathy skills. It's that I've actually met another human being and formed a connection with them. Yeah. But now that's not as yeah, deep absolutely. a connection as somebody in your school, right? So how no, do you think yeah. about well, that? Well, you know that, that now you're having me just go on my separate yes, train. But do, do. I apologize because <laughs> this is not specific to SEL. But in, no, in sociology, yeah, right, we know is, that though. strong yeah. ties and weak ties actually matter yeah, immensely. Connection. Um, and weak ties are sources of new information and, and access to opportunities, arguably. You're actually more likely to get a job through your weak tie network. So I'm okay with a weak tie being forged in the course of an SEL lesson, not just the strong, enduring, caring relationships that I think the field right now prizes between adults and students inside of schools. So it's a, it's a marginal point in some ways. My concern no. is simply that if we're using this as an instrument of equity, we have to balance this idea of relationships as outcomes in addition to relationships as inputs for learning and development. So if I'm hearing you correctly, I, I agree with you a thousand percent. Distal and proximal, you know, we think of these things in distal and proximal terms. So there's proximal environments in which you can affect these things. There are distal ones that are very important. School boards, school communities, businesses, extended families, kids with disabilities, kids with uh, alternate racial, cultural, uh, religious backgrounds, all these kinds of things where if armed with effective relationship skills, children are more likely, we know this in, in proximal environments, are more likely to become welcoming and attentive and able to form relationships with children who are different. And you extend that to broader cultural and social trends, I think you absolutely should press on that But issue. you're making and a different concern, point, Julie. But my concern about the Sorry. reform Sorry. energy is that we focus so much on skills and we consider skills to be the ingredient to curing opportunity gaps that we, and this is not what you are promoting, this is the sort of worst case scenario, we end up doing grit worksheets in classrooms, so students are developing their SEL skills, but we're not actually opening up chances to build relationships beyond those, those schools yeah, that are critical. Yeah, just, just in all fairness, that, that, sorry, that's, that's not, not true. Yeah. We don't, I mean, no one's arguing for that. I, that's what right. I said. I said okay. you're okay. not arguing. Yeah, yeah but I don't I, think anybody is. No, no teachers no. aren't either. But if we, if we consider skills to be the, uh, of, the, of the utmost importance and we ignore relationship assets as another really exciting outcome right, right. of this work, we end up messaging that skills yeah. alone. Right. Just in case my wife is watching, I agree with you 100%. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I just want to chime in because we have some national survey data, nationally representative teacher survey data on how they're approaching SEL. And when you ask teachers about the things they're doing to support yeah. social and emotional development, it's not mostly about skill development. It's actually about um, you know forming connections with the community, service yeah. learning, right. um, all of the a lot of the things that I think you're talking about. So I guess I, you know, I, I totally agree. And how with you are as we well. measuring those things? Yeah. Is my question. Well, that's my that's my only yeah. warning. I mean, right yeah. now we're not measuring much of much of any of it other than school climate. So I do think in the in terms of if you think about measurement, on particularly large scale measurement. Um, those within school relationships are the things that are being measured. Um, I, Phyllis Jordan over there and I just put out a, a paper, so I'll just do a little free advertising for that on how states are measuring. Climate is the one thing that has crept into some states' um, ESSA plans, um, not, not measures of, of skills. And so climate isn't what you're talking about, but I, I do think relationships are at the forefront of how people are thinking about SEL. Okay. I think it's so great that that you're infusing in this conversation relationships because absolutely relationships 
Um, I don't know about word count as a measure um, in the report, but I, font size is a much better metric. And if you look at those 23 times relationship, relationships really uh, showed up, I can guarantee you that it was an 11 point font size. It was more like 36 as the one who was the final editor. So um, relationships is absolutely, absolutely central to this work. And the number of times we sat down and and Dr. Shriver, and he gets annoyed when I say Dr. Shriver, Dr. Shriver would say, relationships, relationships, relationships. If you want me to pick one word, it's relationships. So I love you. Uh, yes. Right? So I'm making so, your case. It's, yeah. All right, so exactly. So, now it's a really important point yeah. that you are making the case because yeah. because we're getting, you know, in the, getting caught up in the minutia, we forget this basic, basic element of this work, which is relationships that talks about the connection and the belonging as being a sign. But I... Let me, let me open sorry. it up right. first. Okay. Sorry. Let me open it up. Uh, questions, usual drill, name, serial number, please ask a question. <laughs> All right, Tim, go ahead while we see if anybody wants to ask. Well, I just was, I'm going to say that uh, I've actually shifted a little bit to sp spend more time talking to people about skills, and I'll tell you why. Um, in just presentations, just mm -hmm. be because sometimes, you know, to Checker's point, the 500-page uh, recipe, uh, or whatever it is, 20-page recipe, uh, I think is overwhelming to people, particularly Great. to school districts, right? And so we can say you've got to do all this, balance all these 400 tension points. You know, when I was in a school district, you know, you had about 20 minutes a year to do planning, right? And you, <laughs> it's like, okay, well, what the hell am I supposed to do? Um, and I would say that you can't implement this work well without context, culture, and ownership, but you've also got to know what you're trying to get done. Agreed. And at so some guess, level, sorry, at some level, the skills instruction stuff, because we know it works pretty well, it doesn't work by itself, but it works. So you, I can teach active listening skills or help-seeking skills. Take help-seeking. You can teach help-seeking skills didactically, very old-fashioned, not with worksheets, but didactically, mm -hmm. and you can see an effect on kids. Important effect, very lifelong effect for help-seeking skills. Now. That's a good skill to have. Most people don't have it, actually. If you look at people with addiction, the, the primary deficit is the absence of, of help-seeking skills, in my, at least in my uh, one way of looking at it. So it's a good skill to teach, even as the culture and the context needs to be supported. But I think we've got to give educators a little bit of concrete, do this, and a little bit of context and complexity, make sure you do it in a, in a holistic way. But holding those in tension is actually a good thing, not not a either or. Again, yeah, agree. I guess. Sorry. Well, I mean, I, I mean, it's interesting because I mean, as we're making these points, and I find the way you're making them compelling, I've also got Checker running in my head. This does feel a little bit like Julia Child. Like the, the, we're, we keep coming back to oh, yeah. the, the, there's these tensions, there's these subtle balances. Right. There's some things that we know naturally or that, that more intrinsically how to do. There's some things like developing um, loose networks of connections with adult, that, that, that seem more complicated and not right. necessarily trained. How, not how do the national leadership groups articulate the right balance, but as this happens in 100 plus thousand schools across 14,000 districts, how do you help Make sure that happens in ways that are consistent with this vision you're sketching, while at the same time abiding all of these caveats that you guys kind of not, you know, acknowledged. I mean, the best. All right. Yeah, oh, Tim or Boyer, Yeah, I know. I, I talk too much, so I'll shut up. Go Let someone go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> well, I think the best thing is to hold the, hold hold on to the concept that this is a field that's evidence based, and I think the second best thing is to not be uh, uh, um, uh, ambushing one another. Honestly, you ask why these things get partisan and why these things get divisive, because a lot of people get paid to divide. And in this town, a lot of people are paid, rewarded, and incentivized to come into a conversation like this and find something wrong and try to make a career on it. That's the truth. There are people who are incentivized to destroy this work, and there are people who are going to be incentivized to defend it in a way that tries to destroy their critics. And that's not education. That's not children. That's not parenting. That's not faith. Uh, but that's real. And 
If you ask me, the most important thing that can come out of a day like today is that we begin the process of ending the culture wars in this field. I don't know that any other field has ended the culture wars, but I think we could end the culture wars and begin peace talks about how we can focus on teaching and learning children. And it's a big challenge. I've said this before with Checker in the room, but we've taken on big challenges as a country before. This is a complicated one. No question about it. But we have no choice. We have no choice, if you ask me. So let's think about where our common ground is. Let's identify that if we do this, uh, if we do it against one another, if we end up in a fight with a who owns the field, or who owns the brand, or who owns the conference, or who owns the standards, and it's my standards versus yours, and I, this is where funders need to help us and not become dividers. Uh, and start to build alignment in, in the way we did when we decided to put a man on the moon and we put 400,000 engineers to work, 400,000 engineers to work for almost a decade to try to get one thing done together, and then you get a good result. But if we end up uh, in, in the way in which we've practiced educational improvement in the past as a community of scholars and policymakers, as Republicans and Democrats, as teachers versus scholars, all that stuff, all those divisions which are deep and real and painful, if we let them have their say, this will fail, and everything we're worried about will go awry Although, and we'll end up where we are. I mean, Tim, I'm curious, when you, when you talk about alignment and, and yeah. say the, the moon landing, I mean, that, 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 that was very similar to the language that, like I remember on a reform like Common Core, and I know that me and I think some of others is in a room, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I, I never described myself as somebody who was opposed to the Common Core, but I had a number of, I think, reasonable questions and concerns yeah. about it. And I remember being put on bad guy lists right. and, made, you know, and, right. and, and just declared out of alignment. <laughs> right. So I guess part of what I'm curious, Brewer, you were going to speak, but I guess what I'm curious about is how, given what you just said, how do funders and advocacy groups um, embrace serious, legitimate concerns and conversation um, Given this concern about not, you know, give, given the points about, um, you know, how you think that this is important stuff to make happen and the value of alignment. Bro? So I, I think a possible solution to this, and that is really needed in the field, as you were saying, 14,000 school districts and teachers trying to figure out what to do, and as you were saying, almost no time to help. We're, we're missing a real group of resources that is, as you put it, Tim, in a way steeped in the field, but whose job is to implement in the field, right? And so that's kind of this, you know, uh, 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 Rick and I, in a book we did a while back called them Learning Engineers, folks who are, are not scientists, but who are the ones who can help the local community and especially the teachers and the principals begin to implement these ideas in ways that are exciting for the community, yeah. Yeah. and then iterate yeah. To, to, yeah. to keep getting better and better at what the community views as valuable. And you can't do that from a single building in DC, right. or even in the state capitol. You, you really need uh, locally present people in the community, from the community, who can uh, transduce complex recipes into meals in restaurants and do that every night, you know, 30, 50 of them, right? And th that's, that's a different caliber and right. kind of work. And I think we need those folks. And I agree. those folks, yes, right. and having them get prepared and, I don't know, professional societies or whatever, they're going to create a real culture of humility for a lot of the scientists around, yeah, that doesn't work here. I mean, I tried it. We all tried it. It doesn't work in half the places. You need a better idea. And we don't quite have that yet ready to go. Instead, it seems to run one way, where often the science and, and scientists think, you're not doing it right. That's the problem. You know, we, we know what to do. You out there are not doing it right. Well, that's, that's, no, that's a, that's a scientist. You need the engineering side. You need folks in the community who can build that real world experience 
and then bring back questions and issues and kind of go back and forth. And I think that can help with this, and this issue. I think that the I mean, funders... Um, oh, Joe. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I, oh. Just a quick point about, you know, it's, I talked to a lot of funders. I, I think funders are recognizing the importance of having the practitioner voice in research and are, you know, both of the IES federal funders as well as, as private foundations. And so I've seen in recent years more emphasis on research not done sort of separate from and to educators, but with educators as collaborators. So that feels like a move in the right direction. Jack, I mean, this is part of the work you and Tim did with the commission and part of what you're doing at UVA. How do you, given that Tim has kind of laid out the, this tension between we want to create room for healthy and, you know, serious disagreement. Tim and I have written about this before, but also that there are, you know, there, there's folks in any space who, you know, make a name for themselves by throwing grenades. How does one, how do you think about trying to steer and negotiate that yeah. path going forward? Well, you know, spending, you know, three years kind of in the middle of a lot of that throwing grenades, I've, I've really um, had a chance to kind of be, you know, think through that. And I think that um, what's really important is that about 80% of it is just us talking to ourselves. And it really doesn't matter. What matters, and, and I, I think it's really important um, that we, we, we infuse this, this last piece of, of data um, into this conversation, is that there's huge market demand for this work. Parents, and we can go through the numbers, whether it's parents or students or teachers or principals, we're talking about like nine out of 10 want this. And it's, it's, the data is, is absolutely clear that out in the marketplace, every possible constituency, stakeholder group, whatever policy language you want to use, they really want to see this work. And so that's very different, and I appreciate the comparisons to, to Common Core, yeah. but, but this is absolutely very different in my mind from some of the other ed reform movements that have not been so steeped in this kind of this kind of grassroots um, market demand. And I, and I think that that really is what we need to focus on and not focus on the throwing grenades you know, inside the beltway. Really, I mean, you've you, you've come at this work. Uh, you spent a lot of time in the personalized learning space. Curious if there's one or two takeaways um, or cautions that you bring from that experience that you would make you would encourage folks in the SEL space to be aware of. Yeah, I think both panels are walking a tightrope of not letting the reality, the rhetoric, get ahead of the reality, right? Which is the the complicated part of advocating for something that maybe in slightly different ways we universally think is really important for kids but also knowing that the science is going to continue to evolve. So again, I kind of go back to my, my first comment around, can we get specific about the outcomes we think can be produced by good implementation and get really clear about the integrated school-based approaches laid out in the Aspen report and others that will get us there? What happened with personalized learning, um, not to sort of call it a day on that, it's still, it's still in action out in the field, but I think there was a lot of rhetoric ahead of the reality, and there wasn't enough time spent on measurement to validate some of the promise um, sort of encapsulated in this big idea. Uh, so I think that's just the discipline that's required, particularly when there's market demand, right? Because then it gets really tempting to be like, yeah, it is great. It's only a good thing. It's never a bad thing to have SEL in schools, and, and that, I think, can shoot us in the foot. Tim, I'm going to give you the last word. I mean, I think one thing to the point you made, w one place where those of us who don't actually have to do any of this real work in schools with kids, <laughs> one place where we can be helpful is trying to steer the national conversation in a way that's constructive and reflective and honest. Uh, given the point you just made about this kind of st negotiating the, this tension between those who are just grenade throwers, but as you and I have talked about before, creating room for useful, healthy discussion and dissent. What's, you know, one bit of advice or one, one thought on how those of us in this room can try to do that piece of it responsibly? Well, I'll quote a state senator from Ohio who spoke at one of the, one of the field hearings we had at Aspen, uh, who at the end of a panel on policy change led by Governor Engler and with several members of state legislature, and I think there was one member of uh, Congress uh, on the panel also, 
she looked out at the room of young people and teachers and so on, and she said, you know, uh, this was, these were her words, so I won't own them completely, but she said, it sounds to me like you're trying to lead a revolution. Don't let us screw it up. Uh, so I think that Jackie's point about demand is, uh, is real. Uh, we can say we want to define the problems clearly. For some people, the problem is problem behaviors. For some people, the problem is anxiety and depression. For some people, the problem is underachievement. For some people, the problem is lack of purpose. For some people, the problem is the achievement gap. The common ground that people bring to this question uh, is can we teach head and heart together? And can the teaching of the heart, if I can use that metaphor, can the teaching of the heart help? Uh, our kids are struggling. And the language they use for that now, for better or for worse, is social and emotional learning. And the hope of those parents and teachers and principals is that people like us will respond and give them real tools and real resources. And that we won't create policy debates and divisive. Uh, we, we have to have real de de debate. Don't, don't get me wrong. Uh, I think we need lots of discussion. And I don't think you need to look at Castle. Maybe this is where the in some sense, the, the home, maybe the big target in the room. We don't have all the answers, obviously, duh. We have, you know, we're, we're working our tails off to try to keep up with the demand. But we need everybody to play in the field. We need one field that everybody will play in and try to build it and not let people like us, honestly, screw it up. Uh, and I, if I could say at a place like AEI or Brookings or Aspen or you know, Chicago or Stanford or Rand or uh, Yale or these places. The, these are places that have had lots of creative discussions, but I'm sorry to say have largely acted as divisive divider energy places when it comes to actually helping schools and children. I, I, that's a pretty broad indictment, and I, do, I mean it personally. I mean it to myself in the mirror. Uh, and if we let educators if we listen to educators and we let scholars actually do the work with them in the field, we'll get good outcomes here. If we play the old game, we're in trouble. Okay. Thank you all. Appreciate it.